All right, brethren, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. It's good to have everybody back. <laughs> John chapter 7. <clears throat> In verse 14, it says now, About the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knowest this man letters, having never learned? The Jews marveled because they only saw a man. They only saw a man, and they saw a man who had not been taught in their schools of religion. They saw a man who they thought was a, from a rural area of Galilee. And, and the leaders here or probably disparaging Christ. You gonna believe this man? He hadn't he hadn't been taught in our schools. And uh, maybe some did marvel at the fact that he knew the scriptures and taught so boldly, but the Jewish leaders were not doing so. But you think about this man, who he is. This is holy God. This is infinite wisdom and power. They're standing before them. This is, this is God who gave the Holy Scriptures. He is wisdom. Speaking of himself as wisdom in Proverbs 8, 14, he said, counsel is mine. Sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. This is that one Paul wrote about in Colossians and said that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's who was speaking to them that day, preaching to them in the temple. This is he of whom James said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That's who this was. Let him ask of God that giveth to all and, and does it liberally. And upbraideth not. He didn't make you feel ashamed for coming to him and asking him. And it shall be given him, he said. But in the wisdom of God, he chose to veil his glory as God and come as a man. And so he stands there in that temple that day as a man. Why did he come that way? Why did he come that way? Why did he choose to appear before men as an unappealing man? with nothing about him to make men want to hear him or, or submit to him or receive his gospel or follow him. What? Why? Why did he do that? Why did God choose to save through this means of preaching that natural man thinks is foolishness? And these were religious men, and they, they thought what he was preaching was foolishness too. Why did God choose that he would be rejected of men and nailed to a cross, and that the message would be that he accomplished redemption through that, that means that appears to man as just utter failure. Why did he choose that? He said in 1 Corinthians 1.19, let's, let's look over there just a minute. 1 Corinthians 1.19. He says, For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's what our Lord was doing that day in the temple. He was destroying the wisdom of the proud and wise and prudent Pharisees. He was making them to be foolishness. Look down at verse 27. He says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's, that's what we hear in our text. They were confounded. They marveled. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and which things which are despised hath God chosen, things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. He makes you know everything is of God. It's all of him, so that he that glories, let him glory only in the Lord. God chose these foolish things to humble his people. He, he, he chose these foolish means, he works all things in providence to humble us to trust Christ alone. That's the purpose. That's what, when he quickens us and he gives us spiritual life, 
to know that salvation is all of him, that's when we know it's not of him that willeth or him that runneth. It's of God that shows mercy. It's, it's when he makes you know Christ is the power and wisdom of God that we know that he alone saves us from our sin. And he's going to do it through this means so we don't glory in ourselves, but we glory only in the Lord. Look at Isaiah 29. This is where Paul quoted from, and I want you to see this. This is sort of setting up what I want to show you in this passage. But Isaiah 29 he said there how that God would destroy the wisdom of the wise and prudent. He said in verse 18, he said, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. You see that? The deaf will hear the words of the book. When I've destroyed the wisdom of the wise and prudent, talking about the day when Christ would come, he says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the book. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. This is his purpose, to bring us to glory only in the Lord and rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Verse 23, he says, When Jacob seeth his children, the work of my hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel and his people will give him the glory. He says, They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Those he saves had the same heart to despise Christ. You and I who he saved, we had the same heart to despise Christ. But what does he do? When he makes you to know you're the deaf and he gives you ears to hear, that's when you glory in him. When he makes you see you're the blind and gives you eyes to see, that's when you glory in him for giving you sight. When he makes us see all our works are filthy rags and makes you see that we're the work of his hands, created in Christ Jesus, righteous and holy by the doing and dying of Christ, by the Spirit of God giving us life. That's when you know this thing's all of God and that's when we rejoice and glory in the Holy One, in the Redeemer. He brings us down from this wise and prudent uh, place of thinking we know things. It brings us to submit to him and learn of him. So in our text here, this is the Son of God. This is God in human flesh, but he's serving God the Father as the God-man mediator. So when they ask him this question, who does he glory in? Where does he point them? Where does he turn them? He points them to his doctrine as being the doctrine of God his Father who sent him. And he tells them he didn't seek his own glory, he sought the glory of his Father who sent him. Now let's read it back in John 7 and verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now he could have said, I'm equal with the Father, and his doctrine is my doctrine, and what he's willing to be taught, I'm willing to be taught, but he's serving God here. And they just see him as a man. And he says to them, my doctrine's not the product of human wisdom. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I was not taught it by men, nor do I preach it of myself. My doctrine is his that sent me. And he already declared to them over six months ago at Capernaum that God the Father is who sent him. The doctrine, he said, the doctrine. The doctrine's the gospel. There's just one doctrine Christ is all. That's the, that's the teaching. Everything is summed up. In Christ is all. And everything we preach. The doctrine's not of man. It's not made effectual by men. And it's not learned by self-teaching and self-study. It's of God who teaches the doctrine of Christ to each one he saves. Now, here's the question. How am I going to know if I'm hearing the truth? That's my subject, how sinners know. How shall a sinner know if the doctrines of God or if he's just hearing a man preaching his own word? How will he know if the messenger is sin of God and is speaking God's word or if he's speaking of himself, just sin of himself and preaching his own word? Christ answers that. Look here in verse 17, John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, 
He's talking about, he said, I was sent of God the Father, and he says, if any man will do his will, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. He that's not sent of God, he's going to give some glory to man, make it appealing to man, give man some part in salvation so that he can get glory from man too. He's getting glory for himself. He, he's, he's going to take the offense out of the cross so that he can, he can get gain from men and, and glory in what he can constrain men to do and, and get monetary gain from men and what have you. He says, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. The same is one that God sent, and he's no imposter. He's not twisting the word to give man glory. He gives the glory to the triune God in Christ Jesus, because that's who sent him. He wants God to have all the glory. Now, look at what he says first here. If any man, if any man, that's wide open. If any man, this is true of any man, whosoever. So that also means if, if any man will not do what he's about to say, it's nobody's fault but man. Nobody to blame. God's not to blame if a man's not willing to do as, as Christ says here. The will of the Father, what is it? He says he that's willing to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father is that those he gave to Christ come to Christ as lowly, humble sinners needy for Christ to do all the saving. To hear Christ speak and to receive his word and believe his word and cast all their care on Christ and follow Christ. That's the Father's will. Go back over to John six thirty seven. This is... I'm certain what he preached that day in the temple because our Lord had one message just like his messengers do. He said in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's the Father's will. He said they, go, they will, they shall. And him that come to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, he that, he that will do my Father's will, here it is, they're going to come to Christ, and Christ won't cast them out. Now watch. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again, again at the last day, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, remember he said the blind are going to see Everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have, as a free gift of God, he may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. If any man will do the Father's will, if any man's willing to do the Father's will, he's willing to come to Christ. He's not proud. He's not, he doesn't know it all. He's willing to come as a sinner in need of Christ. He's willing to come to Christ, to be taught of Christ, to learn of Christ, to be saved by Christ. Our Lord says he shall know the doctrine. By God's grace, he shall know the doctrine. If he has a willing heart to be taught of Christ, to be saved by Christ, to know Christ, he shall know. In Matthew 18, this is what our Lord's teaching us. In Matthew 18 too, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what he's teaching. Our Savior is not saying here that man, a natural sinner, has a will to do the will of the Father. That's not what he's saying. He told Nicodemus, we must be born again of God the Holy Spirit. We must be born again. He said there in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. 
It's written in the prophets, they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. The Father's will shall be accomplished. And it will be accomplished by God. He said to Christ, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. He makes his child willing to confess we're sinners. Makes us willing to confess we need Christ and come. And he makes us even confess that our willingness is of God and not of us. But Christ is declaring it's the Father's will that we come to him for everything. We come empty handed. Not bringing anything in our hand, not bringing any knowledge of our own or, or, or doctrines of men. We come to him empty, ready to learn of him, willing to be taught, willing to be saved by the doing and the dying of Christ his son alone. That sinner will know the doctrine is of God. That's what Christ said. He will know. That sinner will know he's hearing the truth of God through a true messenger of God. Christ and his messenger preaches God's word. He's not coming preaching his own word. He's preaching God's word. He gives all the glory to God in Christ and he leaves the sinner no room to boast. And that's how God's people want it. <laughs> that's how God's people want it. He declares God's word. This is what his messenger is going to declare. Christ is all. Christ is all. He must increase. I must decrease. That's what John the Baptist said. He's a true messenger. They came to him. He didn't take any glory. He said he's the Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of his people scattered throughout the world. I, I must decrease. He must increase. Christ's messenger declares Christ is the only righteousness of his people. And he is the only righteousness of his people. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. My righteousness is Christ alone. You, do you think the Pharisees had that message? No. There's no sufficiency in us, Paul said, to even preach the gospel. Our sufficiency is of God. That's what his true messenger is going to declare. Paul said unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. It's all of grace. It's given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Preach Christ. Christ is declaring the problem here is the Pharisees were proud. They were self-made. They were self-taught, self-sent. They were not willing to come to Christ. They were not willing to cast their care on Christ. They were not willing to give God all the glory. And that's the, that's the problem with natural sin. They're not willing to confess our nothingness. Not willing to confess that we need Christ to, to be our wisdom. And we need Him to fulfill all righteousness for us. And we need Him to make us holy and keep us in His grace. We need Him. Natural sinners are not willing to declare this. Go back over to John 5 and look at what our Lord said here in John 5, 37. He said, The Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. He's speaking to the Pharisees again. Now look at verse 8. I mean verse 38. He says, And you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him you believe not. That's the Father's will. Whom he sent, you believe him. He sent Christ. The Father's will is to believe him. He said, and I know you don't have his word in you, not been taught of, because here I am, and you don't believe me. Now watch what he said. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You come looking to be taught to teach yourself, he's saying. For in them you think you have eternal life. You think there's something you can do to give yourself eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. You're not willing. That's why we have to be made willing by God. You're not willing to come to me that you might have life freely by another. He says, now watch. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you, I'm come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. 
How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor? That means power, the privilege that cometh from God only. You remember what he said back in John 1? Look at verse 12. I showed you this last time, but it goes. See how he said, How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Look here in John 1.12. He said, you'll receive another man coming in his own name that's been sent of himself and is preaching of himself and is preaching man and giving man glory. You'll receive him. And he said, but you won't receive that honor that comes from God only. What's he talking about? John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power. That's the word, privilege, honor. To become the sons of God. To them that believe on his name. And how were they given this honor? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Christ said to the proud Pharisee, you receive the honor one of another and not the honor that comes from God only. He said a man will come teaching his own word. He'll come teaching that there's something a man can do by his will to be born again, and he'll tell you this, preaching for doctrine, the commandments of men, and you'll receive that honor. You'll receive him. He'll come telling you that there's something that you have to do to make yourself righteous and holy before God by your works, and he said, and you'll receive that honor from men. You'll receive the honor of another man saying, now because you've done A, B, and C, now you're a child of God. Now you're a son of God. But Christ says, they will not give the glory to God confessing. They're helpless. Confessing they're unworthy and hell-deserving sinners and they have to have Christ to do everything for them. He said, you won't receive. That's how honor comes from God the Father. You won't receive this honor that that comes from God the Father being the sovereign God of heaven and earth who chooses whom he will and passes by whom he will by free grace. So salvation is all of his grace so that he gets all the glory for saving his people. He said you won't receive that honor, that privilege to be called a son of God by divine electing grace. What an honor. What a privilege that God chose a people not anything good in us just simply by his grace and his love he chose whom he would in Christ and thereby predestinated you to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself that's how he makes his sons and daughters he said you received the honor of some man telling you that that uh, that Christ died for everybody but you got to make it effectual by by letting him save you now rather than that honor that declares Christ came and laid down his life for his sheep. He came and laid down his life for those the Father gave him from eternity and accomplished their redemption and his righteousness is all of him, given freely to us through faith and even the faith he gives us. He said you won't receive that honor. You see the honor, the privilege, the what... what, Behold what manner of love God has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. He did it all. (laughs) That's what John's saying. The Spirit alone gives His children life and faith and preserves us. He gives us the honor of being the sons of God, the power and the privilege of being the sons of God, being born of Him and brought to faith in Christ to cast it all on Christ. Now hear what he says here, and I'm just going to end here with this. I want us to just get what he said. And anybody that that hasn't believed on Christ, especially hear what he says, but this is true of us as believers the rest of our days. He says, it's not God keeping sinners from Christ. He says, if any man will do the will of the Father, is any willing? He said, if any man is willing to do the will of the Father, it comes from him, but he's just simply stating the fact. If a man's willing and in his heart he really wants to honor God and please God and do the will of the Father, he'll know the doctrine. The Lord will make him know. He'll make him know. If he's willing to come to Christ, confessing he's a sinner and he needs Christ 
to save him, to be his salvation, he'll know. He'll know when he's heard the truth. He'll know it. He'll know of the doctrine that it's of God. He'll know he's hearing the truth through one of God's earthen vessels. When he hears the word declared, no flesh of glory in his presence, he'll know that's so, and he'll say, and I don't want to glory in his presence. God says, no flesh of glory in his presence. I do not want to glory in his presence. He'll know that doctrine so. When he hears it declared that all the glory goes to God, he'll know that is true, and he'll say, I see. A to Z, salvation is of the Lord. I want God to have all the glory. How will he know this? Because Christ is the light. We want to do this backwards. We want to know the doctrine and put our seal of approval on it. Isn't this how you got all the churches, you got all the different preachers, you got all the, you're being told all these different things. And, and when folks show up and hear the gospel, they come with all this other pre learned stuff. And they want to try to make God's word fit that. And then if they get all the doctrine lined up and they, and they agree with all the doctrine, and they'll believe on Christ. He says, come to Christ to be taught of Christ. Come to him with a blank slate, willing to learn from him, willing to know what this book says. Willing to know what God says is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Because Christ is the light. He's the wisdom. And all doctrine is given through Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Of God are you in Christ. We didn't put ourselves in Christ. It's of God you're in Christ. And it's of God that Christ has made all to us. And what Christ is made unto us by God is He's made to be our wisdom. That means we're not going to come boasting in teaching ourselves and, 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 and what we think, we're going to come bowing to Christ our wisdom. And he makes, you, makes Christ our righteousness. The end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That's Christ. And he makes you see Christ is the holiness. He is the perfection of sanctification in whom his people have been perfected forever at God's right hand. And it's only when he's formed in you and he's made to be your sanctification that we stop looking to ourselves and partake of his holiness and walk in him. And he makes you see he's redemption. If any man is willing to come to Christ, casting all care on Christ, giving the triune God in Christ the glory as all his salvation, he shall know the doctrine because it's in Christ's light that we know the doctrine and are given assurance. It's in Christ. Listen, Psalm 36, 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. He's the light. Look down at John 7, 37. Christ says basically the same thing again right here in John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, that's what he means by let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and believe on me. And what will happen? Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He'll know the doctrine, whether I speak of God, because I'm giving God all the glory. He'll know it. Hosea said, Then shall we know, if we follow on, to know the Lord. He's going to give us light. He's going to keep giving us light. He makes you willing to want to, to be taught of him and to receive his word, and to walk in his word. And that's the honest heart he gives in the heart of his people. That's what we want. And he says, coming to him, he'll keep giving you light. His going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain and as the latter and former rain unto the earth. He keeps giving you showers of blessing, giving you light to know more of his light. That's the heart he gives. That's the heart he gives. That's how you know that you're hearing true doctrine, sin of God, and that's how you know that you're hearing from somebody he sent to preach the word to you. He's given him all the glory 
and he's not hedging it to try to give man glory. He's giving him the glory. God gets all the glory. All right, brethren, let's stand together. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord, that you speak simply to us and speak the doctrine, the doctrine to us. Lord, we ask that you give us willing hearts to be willing to come to you and be taught of you, to walk in your word, trusting you, looking only to you. Lord, make us truly willing and make us truly delight in your word and your gospel looking nowhere but to Christ nowhere but to that perfect salvation we have in him Lord be with your preachers everywhere today help them to preach your word and truth according to your word help them to speak and Lord speak into the hearts of your people be our teacher let us sit at your feet like Mary and learn of you and be instructed by you. And Lord, make us really and truly know your light and walk in it. Forgive us, Lord, our sins and forgive us where we fail so often. Thank you for your continual long-suffering and goodness, for continually teaching us and instructing us and turning us. And Lord, what a gracious, merciful prophet, priest, and king we have. It's in that perfect master, that perfect Lord and Savior, we ask these things. Amen. <coughs>